Anything, guys? Gentlemen, you tell them that um, we're working hard on a solution. A lot of uh, ideas, there's more ideas than Heinz got pickles. And uh, we're trying, like the Dickens, to find the ultimate solution. When you guys walked in, you were both smiling. It seemed like there was something where you had reached an agreement. Is that accurate? Well, we're, we're working hard, and we're working together, and we're talking, and that's a good thing. And we've made a commitment to continue working over the weekend. So I think any time we're working together, trying to find common ground, trying to resolve the issues, uh, that's a real good thing. Has the governor spoken about uh, when it's time to fish or cut bait in terms of the government shutdown, either? He's made his own statements about a government shutdown, and you're all well aware of those. But did he say, for example, Speaker Roberts, uh, I've got to have a budget by such and such a time, or I'm moving ahead with my executive order that I will sign, sign tomorrow and shut non-essential services down? Well, obviously, we, we want to see as little impact as possible on the people of this state. As the Senate President said, that's an issue that the governor uh, should address, and I'm sure that he will. But he hasn't talked to you about it. He hasn't given you a, a deadline, a drop dead. We discussed the issue generally, but he'll, he'll make whatever statement he thinks is appropriate. Yeah. And there's a constitutional deadline that he has to deal with, and he's doing it. Senator, so we both be back here tomorrow. The night? We know the rest of the night. You're going to be here? You guys going home? Or what's I'm 86. I'm going to be here. Uh, we have our, our uh, leadership um, team still here, the folks from the Budget Committee. Apologize for keeping you waiting. We're just obviously trying to do a lot of things this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, on March 21st, Governor Corzine came to this very chamber and proposed the state budget with a sales tax increase and then issued the following challenge to the legislature. Quote, if you don't like what I've proposed, then give me an alternative that is as far-reaching and as fair, end of quote. Governor, we believe that turned out to be a hollow invitation. The people standing around me have tried for three months to meet that challenge, and we have put forward responsible alternatives. Today, the state treasurer at a committee hearing and in private meetings, verified for the very first time that we had presented him with over $1.5 billion worth of alternative cuts in revenues. The problem is not that our alternatives are not legitimate. The problem is that the governor simply doesn't care for them. Is that enough to shut down the state governor? Governor Corzine may not completely agree with many of the ideas presented to him, but that is not the point. The point is that his treasurer has confirmed that there are alternatives that will generate over a billion and a half dollars that can avoid cuts in higher ed, avoid a hospital bed tax, and avoid the regressive sales tax. Many of the ideas that we have put forward, in fact, are the result of common ground that we have achieved with the State Senate and with the cooperation of the nonpartisan Office of Legislative Services. Regrettably, the governor is refusing to accept these responsible alternatives, or frankly, any major alternatives. He adheres to the position that a sales tax increase is the only conceivable way to balance the budget. That conclusion is preposterous. As a result, our state is now on a certain collision course with a government shutdown beginning in part tomorrow. It simply doesn't have to be this way. My colleagues and I shouldn't be standing here right now in the assembly gallery. We should be on the floor of this chamber debating and voting on a final and responsible appropriations bill that would meet this state's constitutional deadline for a balanced budget. We've reached the crisis point, and all because the governor is more interested in imposing a shutdown instead of reaching an agreement that would make a sales tax increase unnecessary. We consider this threat of a shutdown to be both unconscionable and indefensible. It's unconscionable because executive privileges should not be used to strong arm a tax increase upon the citizens of this state. It's indefensible because we made significant progress in crafting, crafting numbers for a budget that would spare the residents of the state a sales tax increase, a sales tax increase that clearly lacks the support of this legislature and the support of the public. We believe that stopping a sales tax increase is the right thing to do. Can the governor truly say the same about signing a shutdown order? Governor, we have no interest in having a gun placed to our head and passing a sales tax increase for a state budget that doesn't need it. If this state is ever to have another sales tax increase, the revenue must be strictly targeted for the purposes of promoting property tax reform. We urge Governor Corzine to retreat from this precipice and not push the state over the edge into the uncharted waters of a government shutdown. I have personally told the governor that we would be open to any and all alternatives to a sales tax increase, an increase that does not have the majority support in the Assembly, the Senate, or among the public. The governor has basically told us if there is no sales tax increase, there is no state of New Jersey. He is completely wrong. As I told the governor earlier this evening, 
We have an obligation to our state, to our party, to our caucus, and to our conscience. I'd like to now call on Majority Leader Watson Coleman. Just need to reiterate the fact that over the last yes, several uh, months. Bonnie, would you mind going to the mic, please, or else we won't hear what you have yeah. to say. Just, just want to reiterate, over the last several months, we've been working very hard on meeting the governor's standards of identifying reoccurring revenue that is predictable and sustainable and dependable. We've done that. We've also worked very hard to uh, eliminate some of those very hurtful cuts, like the hospital bed tax um, and, and some other areas that have been we've heard from people across the state of New Jersey that is unacceptable. New Jersey has the dubious distinction of being the state with the highest property tax burden in the nation. We can't have the distinction of having the highest property tax simply to support government spending. It cannot be, and it should not be, and it will not be on our watch. If there had been any viable, no other alternatives, then perhaps we would have been there. But obviously from the work that we've done, there were alternatives, and these alternatives meet each and every one of his standards. This is a very sad situation. This is a very sorrowful situation. This is an unfortunate situation, and it's a very unnecessary situation. And the people that will be hurt the most are those that least can afford not to get a paycheck. Some of Carabao. Yes, I'm, uh, I'm really saddened tonight. I, at one time in my life, I was actually the public advocate for this state. And I sustained three consecutive 5% cuts in my budget. And at that time, I made sure that if there was one thing I wasn't going to do, was lay off people. And it was really very simple for me. The ones you wind up laying off as you wind up making cuts are the ones who can least afford it. Bumping rights have the effect of uh, actually bumping the, uh, those that are least able to afford it. As I think of this government shutdown, I'm saddened because I realize that from next week forward, we will have many people in this state who are but one paycheck away from not being able to meet their bills. And the idea that we are going to do this because we refuse to increase the sales tax by one cent is something that I never thought that a Democrat would ever do. I'm truly saddened by the events as they have occurred, and, and I hope that the governor reconsiders his actions and allows us to continue to work over the next couple of days to find uh, what we know can be a resolution to this problem. Thank you. Senator Greenwald. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Uh, this has been a long process for many of us. We have spent the last number of months hearing from the public, uh, three public hearings, multiple meetings with commissioners, a website listening to the people of New Jersey. The government is not listening. In everyday life, people have to learn to do more with less. We do not reward people until they have reached a level of success. In our everyday lives in business, you reward and compensate people for achieving the best. Those who work the hardest, those who meet their deadlines, those who achieve that level of success, those are the programs that you fund. What have we done? What have we learned today? Whether you're here six months or 10, mo or ten years, it appears that we are addicted to spending. It seems that when we had commissioners come in before our committees, they came in unprepared. They couldn't answer questions. Answer questions. They didn't provide documents that were requested. They missed deadlines. And what was the response? We'll give them more money. We hide behind worthy programs, the most innocent of our society, and we ask for more money, and we continue to invest in a system that is flawed, a system that is broken, and a system that ultimately deprives people of a better life and a better future. Responsible people are, are forced to live within their means so that they can plan for tomorrow. Tomorrow we were supposed to start a process of property tax reform, the number one issue in this state. That process is delayed, and now funding to solve that problem is in jeopardy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You've heard today, and it's, it's not only just a, a, a real sad day, but a day that all of us had really hoped not to be here standing at this time of the night having to talk about um, the situation that we are that's in front of us. Uh, much of what you've also heard throughout the whole process, and certainly we understand that Governor Corzine is absolutely f favorable to a one cent uh, sales tax increase. 
I will tell you that I personally can say that I do not object to the increase of a, a one cent sales tax so long, and let me say that clearly, so long it is fully dedicated to property tax reform. That's been our position. That's a position that I think it's a responsible position for us at this time to really start looking at and really be, uh, start talking about. As uh, the speaker and the, the majority leader, the speaker pro temp, and the, and the budget chair has indicated here tonight, we have, we have done nothing but continue to maintain open dialogue, respectful communication with the administration in the hope that we might be able to have some resolve. It is our desire that clearly that continues, but at a time when the different actions have been taken, I can tell you that it is really going to be a very sad, not only a day, but this whole weekend, and who knows how long this will be. We certainly hope to have this resolved. Thank you. I understand you just met uh, with the governor. No, I just said hello to the governor, but but, but but I just said hi. I mean, but given the um, the need for somebody to interview, I was the one chosen. <laughs> so uh, hello gets you a long way today uh, when you're up here on a on a on a Monday. What about all the talks with him? Have you talked to him this past week? Well, I had talked with him last Friday evening because I met with him about 11:45 Friday evening. Uh, excuse me, about 10:45 because we were dealing with the. Uh, potential closing of the casinos. And obviously, that's the principal employer in my district, and it was necessary to meet with him uh, regarding that, and he indicated to me, because of the process, that it would, that would probably not occur until Wednesday, until Wednesday or after the weekend. Now the situation is it's uh, Monday, uh, 8 a.m. on Wednesday. The industry that I represent is the principal employer and a lot of other uh, individuals who provide services to the state of New Jersey are going to be impacted. So, uh, And from what we understand from these meetings, uh, any progress? No progress? Well, I, I'm in the other party, so I haven't, I haven't been at the meetings, but it, I wouldn't exactly say they were uh, all uh, holding hands, singing praises to FDR in the history of the Democratic Party. It doesn't seem like there's much unity there. So, uh, But I, I, think, I think what's occurred is uh, the governor's bringing about a cultural change to the state. He's brought in a number of people from Goldman Sachs, who um, are very bright and uh, really don't need a job and really want to give back to, the, to making it for a better government and brought in an attorney like Stu Rabner who's as clean and as bright as I've ever seen in the front office. And um, you have Treasurer Abelow doing the numbers. You can agree or disagree with him on policy, but he's being honest. There isn't a, an observer in the State House, Republican or Democrat, who isn't impressed with these two individuals in terms of they're very honest and they're giving real numbers. Did you already talk about whether the casino shutdown will bring pressure to bear uh, and in what way and whether that will help expedite a resolution here? Well, my opinion is we shouldn't leave. And I think that's Dick Cody's opinion. Because at 8 o'clock on Wednesday morning, um, a great amount of reality is going to set in. It looks as though uh, the casino industry will be severely impacted, which is my principal employer, and, and 45,000 state employees won't be working providing, providing services. And for, uh, the casino situation, where do, you know, what is that? Well, it's hard for me to forget the casino situation, but, but I, 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 we, have to, we have to get a result. 
we have to stay here until there is a result. You can't, you can't allow a situa situation like this to occur. It's, it's, incredib it's incredibly disruptive. And as I said, uh, but people have to come in with real numbers. But the, whether the casinos are going to, the fact that they would close at 8 a.m. Wednesday morning, if that should happen, and the fact that it appears that it may well happen, is that going to bring pressure to bear, do you think, here to, to get this thing resolved well, sooner than later? Why don't we use the word common sense? If, if there's a constitution in place and the governor is enforcing the constitution as he is required to by being the chief executive of the state, I would hope it'd be common sense. What I don't want to do is engage in fing finger pointing, political finger pointing, saying, you've got to do this because. Don't you care that people aren't working? Don't you care that there's going to be a financial impact to the state of New Jersey and there's going to be a negative reaction of substance? Forget about the press releases and the spin. But what we've observed to date is, and I've talked to Kevin O'Toole and, and uh, Frank Blee from my county, they're, uh, they're on the budget committee. The proposals that have been brought in by the Assembly uh, Democrats uh, are retreads, old proposals, and um, I think the most telling session in Trenton uh, of any committee meeting I've ever heard of, and I wish I could have seen it, was um, Assemblyman Greenwald and the Treasurer. The Treasurer established that there's going to be real numbers and, uh, and sending a sergeant at arms to get them. Uh, that was just a, a juvenile display of uh, uh, theatrics that meant nothing. So uh, I think that that, is a, that was a, a change. In terms be able of to use that shot to cut. I'm going to go by real bites, and I applaud the Treasurer's actions. What about the residual effect on the image of the state after all of this? We have been pretty clear over the weekend and made sure that uh, I signed an administrative order extending licenses, registrations, and um, allowing for an inspection renewal. If, uh, if a document was scheduled for renewal in June, that's been pushed out to July 31st. If it is a July deadline, it's pushed out to August 31st. This has been pretty widely broadcast in the news and, uh, you know, uh, newspapers, radio, television, certainly NJN has been covering this um, round the clock. People, uh, I'm sorry if they're not aware, our website, www.njmvc, Gov not only tells people that the administrative order has been signed and what that means, that they will have their licenses, registrations, or inspections extended for 30 days. It will also tell them when non-essential employees are permitted to return back to work, when our 45 agencies throughout the state will be up and running, what the hours of each of the agencies are, what the address and their directions to, um, to get there are. When we spoke before, when I talked to you about the frustrations, you said it's a, it's, it's a sad thing, but you know, it's part of what's, this, these are consequences or something to that effect. Would you want to talk about that again in terms of the frustration that you're seeing from the public? Each of our agencies has a posting noticing notice to the public that um, they're closed until further notice. When we closed business on Saturday, we were hopeful that there would be some resolution of this before we opened this morning. There are, unfortunately, lots of consequences to government not being in business and for our shutdown. There are 16 and 17 year olds with their driving permit who are not able to take their tests and get their documents. That will not take place until the uh, state of New Jersey is back in business but our website will let them know when that happens. One of the other consequences of this is that all of the, we do about 2,000 transactions a day at each of our 45 agencies. Those will not be taking place and will be backed up at a time that we're really at a peak uh, renewal for licenses. And so your message to the public on that score is once government does get up and running. When we are up and running, there are transactions that can, can be, be completed online like a registration renewal, but middle of the day, middle of the month, middle of the week. That's when we find our volumes are most manageable. We encourage people to look to that. Do you don't think anything is going to happen, you said? No. <laughs> Why are you here? Why am I here? Yeah, you don't because think it's any... I'm here because people are out of work, and there's a downroad effect of a government shutdown. 
a lot of people were affected, and uh, I empathize with them, so I should be here. Who's going to blink first, do you, do you think? Who's, who will blink first? Where I come from, we call it chicken. Who do, who do you think will blink first? You guys are here. I just want to go ahead and have my name with the governor. Do you think you'll blink first? Um, thank you very much. Excuse me. Sir, are you optimistic today? I'm always optimistic. Of course, as you know, there are rumors persisting around this institution. Fueled by who, I don't know, but they're out there. And the fact remains, people of this state want to know that, first of all, government is operating. It's operating the way government should operate. The Assembly Budget Committee is willing to sit down and intervene if we have to with the governor, with Speaker Roberts, with, with Senate President Cody to try to move this ball forward. We cannot go into the rest of this week shutting down all of state government. When people come back that are, are on vacation, they're going to have such a rude awakening. You can't go to the lottery. You can't. This will cripple the entire state of New Jersey. Ruin. This is literally going to ruin the lives of children, men and women in this state. I just cannot impress upon everyone the seriousness of this crisis that we're faced with in the state of New Jersey. Forget the politics of it. Forget the constitutional crisis. It's a crisis in people's lives that we are creating by not settling this budget. So we're clear. We're asking Speaker Roberts to post a bill in the Assembly Budget Committee so we can vote up or down on a budget. Let's have a public discussion about the merits of a budget. Let's move on with the state's business. So let me give you one more thing. There's a group of people in South Jersey who are not necessarily Republicans, but call themselves from what I'm led to understand the Bull Weevil Party. These are people who want to see a, a budget with no new taxes and no new spending. A budget that we have proposed from day one. And frankly, they're looking for us to serve them as they should be served. We're prepared to do it as, as uh, Assembly Men O'Toole has asked, have the speaker post that bill. Let's vote it up or down. Let's see where the people really are. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yes. Hey, Chris. How are you? Good. Okay. Got a minute? Yeah. Uh, you had to stop down uh, transportation projects. What kind of numbers are we talking about? Where? Um, and what about safety? Well, safety is still our highest priority, and that is an essential part of uh, our business. And that part never shut down, never will, even through this shutdown mode. Um, the construction projects that were scheduled to go, we have about a billion and a half worth of construction that has come to a halt. And uh, same thing with about over $90 million in design work. Well, how much a day are we talking about, a billion and a half? Well, that's... If you, that's our revolving number. If that's a billion and a half is the total number of projects on the ground now. So we're talking about hundreds of millions in actual work uh, per day uh, throughout the state. Uh, but I will tell you, uh, the governor has made it very clear when he signed the executive order that he takes no joy in doing this. Uh, and we have done as orderly a, a shutdown process as we possibly can, uh, possibly could, and uh, we will continue to do it. So projects such as what? Route 18 in New Brunswick, uh, which is a major uh, project, has uh, been shut down. We are Route 52 Causeway, we're doing some preliminary work on uh, engineering work that's been shut down. So, and we have projects statewide like that. Uh, again, this is uh, not something that uh, we uh, take joy in doing, but uh, the Constitution is clear: no budget, can't spend money. I want. I just need to, David. Just, I just need one more question. Um, the hundred million, hundreds of millions a day seems perhaps a little high, because it's, if it's you say a billion and a half, I'm taking that. That's a year, right? That's not per day. No, that's billion and a half dollars. Billion and a half is what the value of the construction projects on the ground is. So if, I'll, when I say a billion and a half, I'll give you an example. Route 52 Causeway is a 200 million dollar project. Route 18. 
ready is $150 million worth of project. So there is a, a domino effect on these uh, uh, shutdown processes. That's how, many, what, how many, can we do two please, Bobby? Thank you very much. Uh, how many millions of, dollar, of dollars a day in work is not being done and that, therefore those construction workers out on the roads are not being paid? Well, again, it's in the, in the tens of millions of dollars in actual payment to contractors. Uh, per day? Or? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and uh, again, this is my emergency, core emergency work. For example, there's an airplane cr uh, crash landing on Route 37 yesterday that we had to go clear up the traffic congestion on. That kind of work will still go on. If there's a traffic light out on a state highway, that will still go on. Uh, my focus for the next, uh, whenever the shutdown goes on till, is to make sure that those kinds of emergent repairs and maintenance work continues. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, any movement? Uh, we had a, a discussion. The governor remains, um, I think, focused on the sales tax as the only way to balance the budget. And, and I'm frustrated with that because we've presented uh, lots of alternatives. And uh, we think that there's a way to responsibly balance this budget without raising one of the most regressive taxes that we have, namely the sales tax. So how, how long do you see this impasse going on for? Well, hopefully we'll talk again later. I think the governor uh, um, is going to ask us to come in tomorrow, which we're certainly prepared to do, and we'll continue talking and continue working. I think that um, we, we have presented over the course of the last several weeks hundreds of millions of dollars of alternatives that we think fulfill the governor's challenge to responsibly balance this budget with recurring revenues, but he seems to be uh, singularly focused on the sales tax as the only remedy that, that can balance the budget. The difficulty with that from our perspective is that the budget can be properly balanced without it, and relying on that regressive tax, giving New Jersey the highest state sales tax in the nation, we believe is not the way to go. Mr. Speaker, I What's understand you challenged the, the governor to come up with the names of the legislators who support that sales tax. Not necessarily a challenge. What I've said is that we need to solve this problem. This is having an enormous toll on the people of New Jersey, and it's only going to get worse as each day as this, this shutdown continues and intensifies. And what I've said is that if, if the sales tax is the only remedy, let's identify 41 assembly people, 21 senators who support it. If that can be done, I will post the bill within 24 hours to advance it. And if that can't be done, we need to look at other alternatives. We've got to solve this problem. That's how, did he respond, there, how, did he respond your, how did he respond to your assertion that he should need to come up with these names? Well, I think he recognizes that, and, and I think we'll have the opportunity. He'll be saying, I'm sure, he's planning to address the legislature tomorrow to make his case. And, and I'm, I'm anxious to consider the sales tax. It is my view that there is not the support for it in the General Assembly. I can't speak for the Senate, but I think that this problem has to be solved. And if the governor's preferred solution isn't the way to go, we need to roll up our sleeves identify other cuts, efficiencies, and revenues, yeah. balance this budget, and, and get state services reopened. So this doesn't go to shut down then, Mr. Speaker. That's, that's really what you're laying out here. Not at all. I think that's still a matter that's being litigated. I don't know what the status is as we speak, but but I think that that would be be an, an awful turn of events. But there's not going to be a solution by 8 a.m. Wednesday from the time frame you're laying out here. I don't know that that's the case. We're going to work today, and we're going to work tomorrow as well. Mr. Speaker, are you feeling the political pressure, the Unite Here Union, not the casinos, is speaking out for you to come to the governor's side of things? Uh, some CWA employees, the same. I just spoke to the president of the largest CWA union. They're saying come to their come to his side of things. Are you feeling pressure from these unions or not, I, I feel, or from the public? I feel pressure each and every day. The pressure that I feel is that so many New Jerseyans are struggling. You have folks that don't have access to, to parks, people that don't have access to state services that add to the quality of their lives. So there is an enormous amount of pressure to solve this problem. This is uh, unfortunate. It's an embarrassment to our state. I think that we, we have an obligation to work together. My position is that there are better ways, there are other ways, there are more achievable ways than raising the sales tax to solve this problem. We have to be prepared to confront them. Okay, well, I put a lot of you know, ideas on, but you know, none of them work. Senator, so. that half cent, half cent for property tax, half cent for general fund, is that something that's been agreed to in there or not? No. Thank you. Governor, Thank you. Governor, has to happen. Um, it's just crazy. Okay, you know what? I'm going to go up. Where's my glass? I'm certainly available to talk with the governor so, as well. So as of right now, there's really no progress. The, the, the two sides are still far apart. The governor continues to be focused on the fact that increasing the sales tax to 7% is the only acceptable solution to the budget crisis. We feel respectfully 
that there are other better solutions, fairer solutions, less regressive solutions. We have presented billions of dollars of alternatives, either new revenues or cuts to the governor, and we're just hopeful that he'll consider them. Are you scheduled between you and the governor at this point, or any new talks actually? Are you done dealing with the you? We, we just finished meeting. I'm not sure what we'll do the balance of your day. You seem to have, have offered a little movement. Identify votes in both houses, and I'll post them. I think it's time. Is that, is that, has that changed? That's, that's something we did in just the last hour. Uh, and I think that my point is this. We need to solve this problem, and we need to have a dialogue that has its foundation in reality. If the votes are there for the sales tax, even though I think there are better ways to go, I will post the bill within 24 hours, which is what I told the governor. And if we conclude that the votes are not there, because so much is at stake for the people of this state, we need to be willing, he needs to be willing to look at other ways to balance this budget. Do you have the votes for the alternative plan now? The I understand he doesn't have the votes, but do you have the votes for Well, I think the, the, the underpinnings of any budget is revenue sources that are acceptable. And I think what we need to do is see if there's support for the sales tax. If there is, we advance a budget that has that. If there is not, we need to identify another revenue source. It's not going to be ever conceivable to get a budget pass, passed without a revenue source that makes it a balanced budget. Did I need to go. Half cent, half cent property tax, half cent for the budget. Did that make any headway with him or not? Uh, it did not. Thank you. I've got to go. I've got to go. I'm sorry. Our members feel very strongly that the sales taxes are available. So, for instance, a couple of days ago, the governor's office said it was growing flat. We're just talking to our Burger Assembly folks. So now it's. I'm going to grab it no, coming in. That's none of my business. Wow. I thought I had an apology. <laughs> I was like, whoa. Senator, I might have missed it before. How close? I mean, anything? Anything? Can I come to lunch with? I get to. Come up here. Any progress today? And the governor has been willing to present a budget that's honest. Could I find things where I disagree? Well, I disagree with the bed tax and he took it out. And what he's done today, remember what he said today. Yes, you'll split it. I want to see Joe Roberts' $550 million in cuts. What's he going to cut? Rebates? What's he going to cut? School aid? What, are there a big cut? Are we going to take it from children? We're under a federal court order. So. Um, I think, it's, uh, I think it's a shame, but you know, as sad as it is, maybe it's good this all is brought to a head right now, because what I don't want to see is this reoccurring every year. We have fallen victim to it time after time, and I have been here, I think I was the last legislator to leave the building Friday night, the last legislator to leave the building last night, and I don't think anybody questions how I care about Atlantic City. If anything, I've made, uh, and I've been accused of being a deal maker for Atlantic City. But what I found is somebody who's coming in who isn't making, shall we say, inappropriate deals, who wants to deal straight up on public policy and ideas. And what I find is a speaker who doesn't want to do that, who presented a budget that couldn't be passed, a budget his people wouldn't vote for because it includes an income tax. And they, they wanted sales taxes and income taxes and cuts that nobody would accept. He doesn't really have a budget. So um, the governor's doing the right thing. It's Joe Roberts who's laying off people in Atlantic City. And the people in Atlantic City know who stood up for them for years. They know I've been there day in and day out for them. And I'm not about to say a Democrat, a person of the opposite party, is doing the right thing unless they are. And the governor had no choice because of the Constitution. He wanted to keep them open. And Joe Roberts left no choice because he has to go back to the petty politics that have driven New Jersey's budget to where it is today. Now, for the first time, I guess, that, you know, in your term here, there's a strong possibility the casinos will close tomorrow. And, it's, and Joe Roberts is closing it. Uh, the governor presented a budget. I'm going to cross party lines to vote for it. Um, he's been honest. He's been upfront. And now because Joe Roberts doesn't have a plan, because he wanted taxes that couldn't be accepted, he's decided to punish the people of my district. The burden for these layoffs, 
the burden for hurting the economy of Atlantic City falls squarely on Joe Roberts. Absolutely. Do you think any of them are, are willing to take the compromise today? Do you think well, do you want to say something? Here's, here's what they came up with. The governor, one thing I like about the governor, there's no applause lines. It's just the facts. Nobody has adopted this income tax on people under $95,000. I have heard anybody endorse it. Then they wanted an income tax on people from 200 to 500,000. Then they wanted specific sales taxes on individuals. Then they want to cut, we're under a federal order in terms of children. They want to cut that? They don't have a real budget. Joe Roberts made it up. He wants to go back to business as usual. He wants those McGreevy budgets. But there was an interesting spin in the governor's speech. And he wasn't into spin, it was all fact. But he also you know, talked a bit about the, the morality of the state. The governor has two problems, the budget deficit and the moral deficit. And you know what I like about him? He's dealing with them all at once. So let's get this over with now. Let's do it on the 4th of July. What better day than to end the fact that New Jersey's considered a caricature because of an HBO show on Monday night? And the governor is now correcting it. And certain people don't like it. They don't want the cultural change. Well, the budget and cultural change are equal. And what I have found is this governor doesn't make deals. He'll talk about public policy and ideas. In fact, he'll talk and talk and talk about them. But the reality of it is what we have is a situation where Joe Roberts is laying people off in my district. Joe Roberts doesn't care if they work because he has to play politics. And I don't know why he's doing or whatever, but all I know is this. He's offered no alternative. People are going to be out of work. People are going to lose income. And it's all because of the speaker and the Democratic Assembly leadership. It's appalling. Do you think you'll adopt the budget tonight, by tonight? I, I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving either. even if people say we're not to stay. I'm staying. Thank you. What, why, why is he holding this line? I have no idea. But I know this. The governor's speech, which I want to cite again without any applause lines, it went through the facts. He went through point by point what he's done. His budget is an honest budget. It's been accepted by Moody's and Standard & Poor's as the most credible budget that we've had in years. What did he do? He addressed problems that I did, that I'm responsible for. He didn't do it. He decided to run for governor. He's in office for six months, and he's going, they've been using one-shot items. They've been raiding the unemployment insurance fund. They've been selling long-term debt, and they haven't done a real budget. He addresses it. All the things we do press releases about every year, this guy steps up, and he tries to fix it. So after he fixes it, Joe Roberts' reward for that is, is going, let's go back and do business as usual. And what's occurred is people in my district are being laid off. They won't be going to work tomorrow. Our economy is going to be hurt because Joe Roberts, for some reason, doesn't want to see a change in how business is done in New Jersey, and both in terms of the budget and in terms of the state's integrity. And the governor's speech outlined it perfectly. You know, as I said, he wasn't looking for you to clap. He wanted you to listen. And even though it's clear that you know there's a a lot of interest in people's political futures, the reality is that the state needs to get on sound financial footing. We we've seen crisis after crisis after crisis, and we need to get on a path, and we agree, we need to get on a path to financial stability. That's good for not only our members, it's good for the public in general. How are the essential workers that are in work, how are they affected? Well, they're affected because, you know, they're required to be at work with a short staff. They're working long hours. They had vacation pulled, and, you know, they're sort of in the middle of what feels like an intense uh, working situation. They can't leave their jobs. But it, it's affecting everybody. We have 45,000 people out of work. Today, tomorrow morning, if the casinos close, which start starting to seem extremely likely, we have another 37,000 workers out of work. And the, the impact is a ripple effect, right? It's clearly impacting, and the press has done a great job of looking at the impact on small business, the impact on um, you know, vacations, impact on 
travel and tourism, et cetera, et cetera. All right, thank you. You're welcome. It worked. You know, it's, un it's unfortunate we're at this point. It really didn't have to be at this point. But the governor spoke about revenues matching expenditures. And, and honestly, the world he comes from, normally you reduce your expenditures to match your revenues. You don't do the opposite. So, I mean, there's a compromise to be had here. And their compromise has to be had. Because this is, there's too many innocent people being drug into this. And, you know, if the governor's going to pay all the workers in the state of New Jersey when this is all done, then he should have them all at work and nothing should be shut down. Um, do you think anything's going to happen by the end of today? I'm not sure. i got to get up in caucus and find out what's going on. What do you think of this 50-50 compromise that's being tossed around? Well, the argument is, if the 50-50 compromise is that if you don't need the, well, then why did you ask for a penny if you only needed 50 cents of it? And if we have a $2 billion deficit going into next year, that's what his treasurer told us. If we have a $2 billion deficit, then this doesn't resolve anything, doesn't fix anything. You know what I mean? We, I agree with him. We have to have long-term solutions to this budget problem. And, you know, if you only need a 50, you know, half a penny, then why did you ask for a penny? Do you think he's right when he says, I've made a bunch of significant compromises here, now let's see the assembly do the same? He, he, he compromised on things that were not possible to enact. A hospital bed tax was clearly illegal and wasn't going to work. The water tax, no one was in favor of, no one was in favor of. And the alcohol taxes, the things he compromised were things that were thrown out to be taken off the table later. The only one that was he, I know he was very serious about was the hospital bed tax. And you know, and the federal government was on to that gimmick. They were already announcing they were going to close the loophole that allows that. So in other words, you don't give him much credit for meeting halfway? I, don't, I honestly don't think he's met halfway. I think he's given us a budget. And at the end of the day, if you look at the budget, it's the budget he's given us in the beginning. The key component of it is the sales tax. Now we're talking half of it for property tax relief. And to be perfectly honest with you, $500 million is not property tax relief for the state citizens of New Jersey. It does not give you property tax relief. What's it going to give you, an extra $50 a year when you're taking $250 out? That's not property tax. You have your convictions and he has his. Yes. How do we get out of this? they got to continue to talk. There just has to be... There has to be continued dialogue. Everyone has to continue to talk. This is not helpful. You know, this this was him taking his case state uh, his position to the to the people in New Jersey, where really the discussion needs to be with Joe Roberts, Dick Cody himself, and other leadership members to strike a compromise. Everyone wants the budget to get done. We don't want innocent people to be harmed. But when the governor announced that he was going to pay all the state workers, you know, after this is done. I got to be honest with you. Why leave him home? Tell him to come in and work, and let's pay him. We didn't need to shut this government down. We didn't need to create the chaos at the casinos, and we need the governor and our leadership to sit down outside of this arena, in a room, and resolve these differences.
your, your impression of the, the governor's speech? I actually think the governor did a great job in laying out what really needs to happen going forward. There has been endless talks and compromising and compromising and compromising, and it's time to get it done. You know, the assembly needs to put a budget on the table. And we are three, four days past the deadline. We have 45,000 people out of work. We have another 38,000 workers getting laid off tomorrow morning in the casinos. I would say to the assembly leadership, you need to stay here in the State House 24 7 and do your jobs. We all want to be home. It's the 4th of July. But our members want to get back to work. They're not enjoying this holiday as they should, and the casino workers are certainly not enjoying a holiday the day before 38,000 people stand to lose their jobs and the incredible uncertainty that that means going forward. What do you plan? Uh, to, going forward, I know you, people are going to talk about the big day tomorrow. When do they? Be well, you know, we we had people here yesterday. We have members here today, and we're going to stay. And we will have a rally tomorrow, and we believe we'll be joined by some of the casino workers, and apparently another demonstration here on Thursday. And we're trying to send a clear message that you know this is not a game it is an economic hardship for people it is an economic hardship for the public as well as for our members and other workers and you know the legislature needs to be taking this much more seriously than it feels like they're taking it right now they're here and they're in caucus but i'm hearing rumors that people are leaving that would be shameful they should stay here they need to get it done they need to put a budget on the table and get people back to work and restore the services that the public cares about yes, yesterday the governor's passion and today his message was clearly heard throughout this building and i think throughout new jersey the advantage of being here today is that this will lead national stories around the country you know that new jersey is in a crisis of its own making and i think that I honestly believe that the, that the public trusts intuitively John Corzine with financial matters. You know, all these years at Goldman, all these years on Wall Street, this is somebody who understands how to put a budget together and how to do it responsibly. So I think that's beginning to become clear. But the pain is going to be felt a little bit today and, and yesterday with the lottery and soon Atlantic City is going to close. But the ripple effect is going to be throughout New Jersey over the next several days. So I thought this was the right speech, the right tone at the right time to exactly the right audience. The governor has, has enjoyed public support because yeah. it's a very, very tough time. Yeah. And, and it's kind of odd, you know, in, in a way. Would, would, you, would you think he's enjoyed public support and the legislative have basically taken the blood of this, it appears, so far? Yeah, well, you know, at the end of the day, the governor is the governor. And when, when people go to a lottery agent and they say, you can't play the lottery today because the governor closed this down, I mean, everybody has a lot to lose, and but everybody has a lot to gain if people can come together and find a rational alternative to just you know a stalemate between the assembly and the governor's office i think today people being at the state house going into caucus listening to his message that they're gonna they're, they're gonna have to make some progress and put this budget to bed full name is for me represent the AFSCME state and local government employees. In the state facilities, we represent the psychiatric hospitals, the developmental centers, veterans and military affairs, some people in corrections, and the daycare centers. You said yesterday that you were obviously concerned about your membership because everybody's afraid right now because nobody's really experienced that before. Is that still the mood? 
This, in all of the years we've been around, is a precedent setting. Our membership were classified essential when some of them had never been essential before, and others who were non-essential are now essential. But the big picture for us is that we're being asked to provide a service. We're doing our jobs. We can't figure out why the New Jersey legislature isn't doing theirs. Because at the end of the day, we come when needed and called, and that's what we expect from the legislature as well. What was, what's your reaction to the governor's speech today? Because he's, he's enjoyed basically public support from the unions and, and other special interest groups um, all along with, with his budget. I mean, we think the governor's on target. We think that his compromise is reasonable. He is partnering with the legislature in the sense of compromising and splitting the tax. Uh, if there's relief for the budget and relief for property taxes, we think that's the way to go. Thank you very much. Nothing like some of have jobs Can this get resolved today? Can it get resolved today? Well, I understand the Assembly Democrats have hunkered down. They haven't moved out. We've asked that all of our members stay, which they have. We've asked that the Assembly Budget Committee meet today. We've asked that the Speaker post a budget today so we can discuss in a public forum, up or down, whether it's the uh, Cody Compromise, whether it's the Corzine Budget or the Roberts Budget. So we've asked for action today. We're not going to leave until we have some uh, signal from the Speaker that he is willing to take the first step today. But have Kevin, you is it time to change signal? leadership in there? Have you gotten oh, that signal? Have you is it, gotten that signal it time to that they're change? willing to start doing anything today? Uh, we have not gotten that signal yet. I know there's some very frustrated individuals on the Democratic side of the aisle. I think that uh, there probably is some very heated discussions right now, but I think, uh, look, we're here to try to give some alternatives to the governor, as he has suggested. We have tried diligently to, to work with the governor on, on some of these issues. We've tried to work with the speaker. Uh, we're here to work. We're ready. We're ready to do the budget committee. We're trying to break this deadlock right Did here. The That's, I'm sorry if I can just finish that. We're here to break the deadlock. We met with the governor a little while earlier with the chief of staff. We're trying to get the ideas to the front office that uh, hopefully there's some flexibility. But we're still adamant about having a $2.2 billion um, in cuts that we think are, are achievable. Uh, sat with the treasurer, went line item by line item with the four Republican budget members. And hopefully we can get to where they have to go. What's your Kevin, is it time to change the speaker in that, in that chamber there, Kevin? We're here to talk about the budget today. I think that's the most important thing. We have a cri uh, constitutional crisis. Uh, there are a lot of folks, and frankly, we'll talk about how many folks are going to be out of work in Atlantic City tomorrow. We're talking about folks who aren't going to have a paycheck in a couple of couple of days. Frank, we'll talk about the Atlantic City problem. Yeah. Well, as, I, as I've said all along, for, for the last number of days, uh, there's been a lot of banter back and forth in the state. For a lot of days, it's been a lot of paycheck. We looked at the sales tax. We said it's about $260. We had gut mayors being sworn in in Democratic cities, and our fellow legislators from the other side of the aisle thought it was too important to go and party with them, go to their galas, and go to their swearing in, rather than doing the people's business and passing the budget, which is constitutionally mandated. It's a disgrace the governor waited this long. He should have called this in at midnight on Friday night, July 1st. And it's a shame and a crime that we are not working on the budget now. I mean the word crime. It is constitutionally mandated. It is the law of the state of New Jersey. And right now, every member of the legislature that is not willing to talk about this budget and sit at their desks are breaking the law. And they are disrespecting the people of the state of New Jersey. Ryan, you're in the talk with the governor. We'll have something to say. Well, sure Republicans are saying they want the community. And I have to ask my colleagues, can you offer them anything to talk about? Can you talk with the governor first? The governor's office. Perhaps we're going to have a break through. And perhaps we're finally going to get some. So here is Mr. Roberts. Nothing to say. Yes. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Take it to that. Right there. Yeah. yeah. Here we go. Good. Thank you.
We're here. How are you doing? Good, how are you? All right, I guess your reaction to the speech, and uh, he sounded a little frustrated today, the governor. Well, he should be frustrated, and uh, we're, all, you know, we're all frustrated, but you know, he has been uh, honest uh, from the beginning and forthright in terms of how it is he thinks uh, things should be. Uh, he's worked with the leadership of both houses, uh, and uh, you know, John provides, I think, just a different type of leadership. He has said from the very beginning, we have to truly end the way business is done in Trenton. In terms of balancing the budget, how it is that we have recurring revenue so that it's sustainable. So that next year at this time, we're not here doing this, that there is enough, there are enough resources in the budget to meet the demands of the state. And that means from children in, in foster care to senior citizens to the daily projects of, uh, of state government. Uh, and I believe that he's going to stay committed to his uh, version of what the budget should look like. Uh, and it is that the legislature has to reconcile their differences. Do you support, I assume, the, the compromise that, that they're talking about that's on the table, the Cody, so-called Cody compromise? I do support that, and, and I thought that a compromise will at least lead us in the right direction. But apparently the, you know, the assembly leadership doesn't see it that way. It seems to me it's, you know, it's their way or no other way. And when you offer a compromise, not only do you have to seriously consider it, I mean, you really need to sit down with your partners in government and figure out a way to get there. And they've not, really not been willing to do that. It's been press conference and press conference and negotiation by press conference. And honestly, that's not the way it ought to get done. And the people of New Jersey are frustrated and angry. They ought to be. I mean, presumably, if the Assembly Democrats had a balanced budget, they would have passed it, which is, I guess, what the governor keeps saying. That's right. They would have presented it to us. Uh, but I think that before they present it, they, they ought to know if there's support in the Senate and there's support in the governor's office before they do that. Because what we'll do is just change it, kick it back to them, and we'll be back here uh, doing this all over again. So this entire exercise. Uh, so let's have some honest dialogue. Let's bring it together. Uh, and egos have to give. I mean, this is a, uh, at some level, this is a power struggle, and it has no place, uh, particularly when it affects the lives of people, uh, thousands of New Jerseyans, not only who work for the state, but those who want to, it's, it's, a, it's a holiday and people want to be out and about with their families uh, and the legislature and the impasse of presenting, preventing them from doing that and it's time to end it. What did you think of uh, the governor's speech? Uh, this is yet another day and the people of New Jersey suffer and no budget bill has been released from either committee, not the assembly budget committee or not the senate budget committee and this is the responsibility of uh, the governor and the majorities in both houses of the legislature i truly believe that if our side the republican side controlled one house of the legislature we would have reported a budget bill out of the committee and to the floor do the republicans have a bill in the world uh, on the essentials of the wor essential workers bill that would pertain to the casinos uh, the Republicans have suggested $2 billion in cuts. This has been suggested by Assembly Republicans, and I give them great credit. And the administration and the majorities have not looked at proposed cuts on the Republican side. 
New Jersey does not have a revenue problem. New Jersey has a spending problem. Even some Democrats are calling this a power struggle. They said that some egos have to give. Do you think that's at play here? Uh, I believe the people of New Jersey are suffering based upon an internal debate in the Democratic Party, and it's a fa failure of leadership on the part of the Democrats who control the governorship and both houses of the legislature. With all due respect, it seems everyone's running around here saying they're not playing politics, but that seems like a bunch of bunk. Isn't everybody running around here playing uh, politics? I believe deeply in the New Jersey Constitution, and I believe I have the reputation of trying to protect the New Jersey Constitution. And if we Republicans were in control, at least in one house of the legislature, there would have been a budget bill presented to the house of the legislature, the Senate, on time and I believe deeply in the deadline of June 30th and for the first time in the history of the state that has not occurred and the people of New Jersey suffer and we need a budget document today. Senator, but at what point do you just say, okay, we have two ideas here, actually three, when do you chime in and what are you going to vote on? Which way? Uh, we, oppose the the we oppose the raising of the sales tax, we also oppose the raising of the income tax in any form because New Jersey is uncompetitive with neighboring states. If we were to raise the sales tax, we would be uncompetitive with Pennsylvania, which has a 6% sales tax, with Delaware, which has no sales tax, and with suburban counties in New York State at 6%. We are uncompetitive with neighboring states, and that is why we have the budget crisis we do in New Jersey today. So you're not willing to consider the three options on the table? Uh, I believe that the Republican option on the table is to cut spending, and I hope that our colleagues on the Democratic side of the aisle will review proposals that have been put forth by the Assembly Republican Caucus. But what do you say to people that say that that's a futile effort? And at this point, with the clock ticking, there are three options on the table. Uh, how, how much longer are you willing to fight? I would hope that fiscal responsibility is never a futile effort. And I call upon our Democratic colleagues to examine the proposals we have put forth. And I do believe that this is becoming a power play among various components in the Democratic Party. And as the result, the people of New Jersey are suffering. You wouldn't support the tax increase under any circumstances? Republicans do not favor raising taxes. We do not have a revenue problem in this state. We have a spending problem. And we also have a constitutional issue because the Democrats have violated the Constitution of New Jersey. The general public really doesn't understand this too much. We need to cut spending. The governor is proposing, and the speaker is supporting, a 10% increase in spending in this budget, nearly $3 billion. That's wrong. We need to make sure we cut spending to make sure that's how we address the problem. People in the state are hurting. The state is no longer affordable for so many people. And we need to do what we can to cut spending here and now. And this has become a food fight between the speaker and the governor, and the people in New Jersey are getting hurt because they're getting stuck in the middle. We need to make sure we have real leadership who's going to be fighting for real reform. And we need help from where, wherever we can get it. And Bob Menendez has failed on this front, too. He's nowhere to be seen on this front. We need to make sure we have real leadership who's going to be fighting to make sure that this state is more affordable. Um, even some Democrats are saying now this is turning into a bit of a, an ego fight, of, of, of test of wills between Democrats. Do you get that sense here? Of course it is. This fight should have been resolved weeks ago. We're now days past the constitutional deadline, and people are getting hurt by this. People are losing out of their jobs. We need to make sure that we don't continue to have this food fight between the speaker and the governor, and we look at real ways to reduce spending. Many people have offered nearly $2.2 billion in realistic cuts. And right now, all people are fighting over right now, between the governor and the speaker, are ways to increase people's taxes. And it's wrong. It should be resolved now. And to be called down here again today and have no resolution for the fifth or sixth straight day in a row is wrong. And it hurts the people of the state of New Jersey. Yeah. All right, Senator, can we jump in with you? Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Um, first of all, I guess your reaction to the speech, the governor sounded a little frustrated. I guess very frustrated, actually. Um, I, I, this is unprecedented. We certainly haven't seen this before. I think it just shows that it's ratcheted up his, um, you know, his resolve to get this done um, favorably to him. And uh, what about some, even some Democrats are saying now that this is turning into a little bit of a, of an ego fight here that that people are standing down that there's really a lot going on here and really no budging. And what what do you make of that of, of that uh, characterization? 
Well, I think last week some you know, people were saying that it's gone over to their personalities rather just this is about public policy. And I, and I think we're going to see that uh, increasingly as the week goes by. Um, and and it, it doesn't serve anybody. It really doesn't serve any of us if this you know, continues to be a stalemate and we're at loggerheads, you know, particularly if it is over personalities and ego, more ego driven. Is this getting worse? It is getting worse. And you know, when you think about what is on the, t you know, at stake for next week, you know, New Jersey PAD is going to not be able to reimburse the medications for seniors who are on fixed incomes. I mean, things that we really haven't focused on yet, we'll continue to see in the, in the coming days and weeks if this continues. They still are going to the situation where it's tax, 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 spend, spend, spend. Now aren't they at the ridiculous position of actually now shrinking the state revenue because it's gotten so dysfunctional? Yeah, that's the problem is you've got businesses that are leaving the state en masse and they are, uh, they, they're they being taxed out of the state. We're losing jobs on a regular basis. There are 40 states right now that have surpluses. This was in the Wall Street Journal about a week ago. We're one of the few states, in fact, the only state that has no reason not to have a surplus. The other states that don't have a surplus were all hit by Hurricane Katrina. So they have a, a, a very logical reason why they don't have surpluses. What's happened with this, uh, the Democrat regime since they've come in, McGreevy came in, has raised the, uh, the budgets uh, between McGreevy and five years. The budgets have gone up over 50%. This budget, they're talking about cutting, well, it doesn't cut anything. It's 9% higher than last year. Well, McGreevy had one budget that was 16%. If you add them all up and look at an increase of over 50%, well, you're going from 20, approximately $21 billion to $31 billion in five years. That's wrong. That's there's why we have a problem. discussion that there is about 10,000 political appointees out of the 78,000, and Corazon had committed to cut half of them. Is there any sign there's been any effort to reduce that patronage workforce? Well, again, I really haven't seen any proposals. I haven't seen anything. They don't even have a budget on the table. They have nothing. This, this is, uh, you know, they're totally incompetent out there. I, I, I pox on both their houses. We've been sitting here watching a urinating contest between the governor's office and the assembly speaker. That's all it is. So it is about egos, you think, at this point? It is egos. In fact, they've got to put their egos aside. This is nonsense. I've never seen this. You know, this bad. We've been here uh, till July 3rd on one session. I think that was, uh, it was actually because one house was Republican, one house was Democrat, and we had a problem with Green. But here you have the governor is a Democrat, the assembly is Democrat, the Senate is Democrat. W what the hell is going on? What did you make of the governor's speech? Uh, it, it's a nice speech. It's a very nice speech. The problem is he can't get them to go to the table and come up with a budget. Now, uh, you know, there, there are ways that the governor has of making sure they, they have party unity and uh, party discipline. Um, in the past, Florio would take them to the woodshed and, you know, that's where they go. They go to the woodshed, they're told that their uh, counties will not get judgeships, they won't get jobs, they won't get anything. And that's a problem. You know, I, I, I don't know where this is going. I don't know how long I'm going to be here. And I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm sitting, I'm, I'm going to be down support here. the speaker? I don't support anybody because I haven't seen a budget. Uh, there's no way I'm voting for all of these new taxes. We've been saying, the Republicans have been saying, you should be cutting. We've given them $2.2 .2 billion in cuts. Give an example, a concrete example of something that they could do today as a cut. I've got a list. I can give you, I can give you all of the cuts. Everybody had imagined the inevitable did happen. I guess your reaction now that we're actually here at this point. Well, it's, it's frustrating. Uh, I'm embarrassed, and it's, it's terribly sad for the casino employees and the other people who are, who are involved here. I mean, this is when the casino rank-and-file employees make the extra money that tides them over in the winter. I mean, it's, this is the Christmas money. You know, it's great to say a cocktail waitress may make $200 a day in July. That makes up for the $35 a day they make in November, December. And to knock them out of the box... Um, as I say, it's very frustrating and, and embarrassing and sad, and I, and I believe there are alternatives. Um, you know, and every alternative has been suggested, has been rejected. Declare them essential employees, that's, that's rejected. Use the state police, that's rejected because the state police have other duties. Well, use the state police on overtime. 
No one's saying take them away from their duties, their normal duties, but put them in on overtime. I, I think the troopers would be happy to, you know, get the time and a half. And, and I know the casinos would more than be happy to pay that bill as opposed to being shut down. So whatever's proposed just seems to be automatically rejected. And in the meantime, the casino fund, which supports senior citizens programs, supports disabled programs, is losing a million three a day. And we got 30,000 people, working people, that are out of work. A lot of those folks live paycheck to paycheck. And I don't know, I don't know what happens to the long-term investment climate in Atlantic City. Seeing we, we, we are on, obviously in these uncharted waters, do you think people are grasping just the magnitude of what has happened down there? We're, certainly in Atlantic City, in, 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 in that region, we're grasping the magnitude of this because um, the ripple effect of having 30,000 people out of work, not only does that shut down the casinos, that impacts all the, all the retail merchants, all the you know, folks who are the entire economy is going to feel that because now all of a sudden folks aren't going out to dinner and folks aren't you know shopping the way they were shopping before and so on so um, uh, it's extremely frustrating as I say and I, I can only repeat what I say it's frustrating it's embarrassing and there are solutions at hand that just don't even seem to get a look they just get an automatic rejection and but not enough to first of all, I guess your reaction to the governor's speech he sounded a little more frustrated more angry today than perhaps he's well I think um, uh, people are get, I think the people of New Jersey are going to get angrier every day and I think we're all frustrated uh, certainly this is a very very troublesome issue and a very troubled time for the state and uh, people are getting hurt all over and uh, we have to find an answer to this and I think an expansion of the sales tax versus an increase of the sales tax is what we're talking about. The assembly, from what I know, wants to talk about expanding it onto all kinds of services and so on, and the governor is talking about increasing it. Again, I remind the people of New Jersey, we have no tax on food, clothing, or shelter currently, and we believe it should stay that way so that the essentials of life are not taxed under a sales tax proposal. So, the, so here we are. Now, are we going to get enough recurring revenues if we expand the sales tax onto magazine subscriptions and uh, two-week summer rentals? I doubt it. And we can't make up fairy tales to pretend that we're going to get the revenue in. The due date on debt service is here. We have to pay it. We have to pay at least something toward our pension obligation. And it's time for everybody to grow up and accept the responsibility that we all took part in creating. So you think that the, uh, the Senate compromise is still available and that will ultimately be part of this solution? Uh, as far as I'm concerned, it is a good compromise. I wouldn't have even gone that far to compromise, actually. But there it is. And um, certainly a majority of the people I talk to are willing to accept it. And uh, the people I talk to out there at home in my own district, I still, when I have time, get to the supermarket on occasion, walk down the main street of uh, the community in which I live. And people seem to say, to, to me at least, end this nonsense, we're all willing to pay the penny, let everybody get back to work. I mean, here we are. You, you, you've been around a while. What, what do you make of all this that's going on? Well, Zach, I, I, I could not imagine if you had told me six months ago that we would be in, in this kind of a constitutional crisis that now has turned into a real physical crisis as it relates to New Jersey citizens. We have 50,000 Atlantic City employees uh, not working today, uh, the first time in history since we've had gaming in the state of New Jersey that uh, our largest resort has been shut down because of the incapacity of the legislature, specifically the Democrat leaders, to be able to come up with a conclusion and a budget. We've got our state parks closed, we have people going to motor vehicles, and uh, there's no one there. Uh, these, are, these are services that people expect to get uh, on a daily basis. They believe that's why there's a government. They don't think that this dome is why they have a government. They truly believe that, that, that there is a purpose of government and is to ensure that the operations of government happen on a daily basis and now they're not happening and I think the people are quite angry. Are we, uh, are you okay on the light? Yeah. 
Ron? Yeah. Okay. He's a, he's okay. a pro. <laughs> and just, uh, I, I just want to ask you, in terms of a lot of even Democrats are saying this seems to be turning into an ego struggle, I would ask you, Governor sounded an angry today in his speech. What do you make of that, and do you think that this is basically a clash of egos? There's no question. Uh, we have 120 people coming every morning at 9 o'clock to solve a problem that two people have to deal with. And, it's, and it is Joe Roberts, and it is our governor. And I think the governor is very frustrated. It's his first term. Uh, I am not so sure that uh, he had the experience to understand how to deal, that he needs 41 members of the Assembly and 21 members of the Senate to agree with his, his budget. But now I think the level of frustration is uh, very high. You could see it on Joe Roberts' face as well. Uh, I, I hope and I truly do uh, that these folks get together and get their act together because now it's affecting regular folks. I as a legislator, I've been here 13 years, I am frustrated, I feel like I can do nothing. I can't, my constituents call, I have 217,000 of them, they believe we can do something down here. It's not in our hands, it's the hands of the speaker and the hands of the governor. I hope by the end of the day that there is a bill, the governor is correct, until he gets a bill we can't even talk about opening up the state again. Now, all of a sudden, they're given permission to care about Atlantic City. They taxed Atlantic City in 2003. There were going to be layoffs in 2003, and I was fighting it. And they said it was the law then. You know, Van Drew, it depends on what direction Roberts gives him that day. So that's the direction he got. Now they care this year. They care this year because what, they, what they're saying is people are getting laid off. They're getting laid off because of Joe Roberts and the South Jersey Democrats, period. Thank you very much. Senator. Thank you. Senator. Senator, we've got to be very unhappy with what has happened transpired. I'm obviously unhappy. I, I think people who know my career know that one thing, Bill Gormley of came to Atlantic City and employing people, that's the thing that would be the hallmark of my career, I hope. And now I see people not working in my district, and here I am. I'm a Republican. I will vote for John Corzine's budget. I will vote for the sales tax. So I can answer to the people in my district what I do. Then I see panderers like Van Drew. Oh, you can't. Well, three years ago, you said they had to be closed. That's when Joe Roberts told you, we'll go that way. Well, I'm pretty consistent. I never want them closed. But you have an appropriations bill, and that's the law. And we can't do anything about it now. Now, the bill I had in that's been sitting there since 2004 would have dealt with this. But it hasn't become law. And I'm dealing with the here and now. I want people back to work. I want state services provided. Joe Roberts doesn't have a budget. He doesn't have a plan. He's just pandering, as is Van Drew and as is Whalen and the whole crew from southern New Jersey. Now, am I mad? Of course I'm mad. People aren't working. And, and it's not like I'm sitting here back going, oh, let them figure it out. I'm for John DeCorzine's plan. I'm a Republican. Boy, that's kind of an answer, isn't it? Well, I'm raring to go. Let's vote for it. But let me see your, I would like, why don't we take that brain trust from southern New Jersey? This would sadly be uh, something that should be at a comedy stop. And have them go down and present their budget to the treasurer. And I'd like all the media there to see it. I want to hear their ideas. I want to hear their tax ideas, their cuts ideas. They haven't had any. You have not seen a document from them. Wouldn't you have an alternate proposal available? They don't have one. Well, I guess that's also the point the governor had been making, which is that it's incumbent upon them to pass something. Don't, why don't they type out something? I mean, well, I mean, all right, every day you're walking around the hallways, and we're, what's their plan? Well, yesterday was kind of an income tax uh, from 200000 and above, okay? Well, I imagine once Senator Sarlo heard that from Bergen County and the rest of the Bergen delegation, they said, are you out of your minds, okay? Then before, we were going to have an income tax on people under $95,000. That was the rumor we heard for two or three days, right? Then that flowed and went back and forth. Then we heard there was some tax on shoes, OK? Now then they're always willing to tax casinos. They're always willing to tax casinos. I have not seen their balanced budget. So am I emotional about the district? Sure. I spent my whole life creating those jobs. And no one, even my critics, will question that. That's been my career, creating jobs in Atlantic City. I see people getting laid off. So I had a bill in from 2004 that would have corrected it. The Dems, well, that didn't move. I made up the same arguments in 2003. They said I was wrong. Now they're coming to you, we want them to stay open. Want them to stay open? That's cover, because you're the ones who made the mistake. You didn't do a budget. You're pandering. You're trying to lay blame on the governor. Listen, I didn't campaign for the governor. And I guess if you check the records, I raised more money for Republicans against the governor's ticket than anybody else last year. How about that? 
But here's the governor today. Here's the governor today, and he's got an honest budget. Now, somebody shows me another budget that's better. I'll look at it. All I do is take this. Let's take the South Jersey legislators, because they have so many ideas. Five days after the state shut down, I want them to go to the treasurer's office, and I want all of you there. And I want to hear Van Drew on the budget, and I want to hear Whalen on the budget. Of course, Greenwald's always been incredibly impressive with the treasurer already. And I want to hear about their taxes. I want, they don't have anything. It's, it's a game with them, and for me, it's people working. And none of them can competently walk down to that treasurer's office and say they have a budget. They don't have a clue. Because every day, we wait for the rumor. And it's this tax or that tax. I haven't seen anything typed yet. And by the way, access to the treasurer? You can walk in his office any, I've never seen a more accessible treasurer to Republicans or Democrats. So. Folks, thank you very much. Uh, our day began with a very sincere message from Governor Corzine outlining his budget and, and making his appeal to the members of the legislature. Uh, after 105 days since the governor's original budget address, after over a dozen town hall meetings all over the state, after a $2 million campaign in support of the sales tax increase, after weeks of meetings with members of the Assembly Caucus, after the threat of a government shutdown, and after, as I said, a stirring speech and appeal this morning to the legislature, the General Assembly then had a four-hour caucus on whether there is support for a sales tax increase, even with half of the increase dedicated to property tax relief. Out of 49 members of the Assembly Democratic Caucus, there are 15 who are prepared to support the sales tax increase. The opposition to the sales tax increase was as diverse as it was deep. It came from the north, the central, and the southern parts of our state. The members were black, white, Hispanic, veteran legislators, and newcomers. Their opposition to the sales tax uh, being used for the purpose of the budget has a number of, of, of causes. Um, there are those who think that we should focus more intensely on cutting spending. There are those who think that we can find better, fairer, less regressive means of raising revenue for the budget than the sales tax. And there are those who feel that any sales tax increase needs to be dedicated dollar for dollar for property tax plan. Well, I would note that when uh, the governor made his budget address in, in March, I believe it was March 21st, he had been looking at two ideas. One was a sales tax increase. The other was making New Jersey's income tax more progressive. Other than the sales tax increase being used to balance the budget, we have not ruled anything in and we have not ruled anything out. The bottom line is tomorrow everything shuts down. This is going to shut down, right? That's, um, that, that, that's, that's our understanding. Okay. And no more work tonight. Let me just, no, that's, that's not accurate. What occurs tomorrow is up to the governor. Um, we have, uh, we've been working day and night. We're gonna be here working through the night. Um, we would certainly appeal to the governor to minimize any impact um, on the state, both in the public sector and are impacted as well. We, ho we, we hope and, and we believe that he will be as sensitive to that as he can be. We have been working as hard as we can and we're gonna redouble our efforts. The budget committee is gonna work through this evening to try and come up with alternatives that allow us to, to develop a balanced budget. So it's very he knows to be in operation tomorrow, uh, I guess 8, 8 a.m. is when they've talked about, about shutting down. We hope that he will certainly consider that. Those alternatives are? From that proposal to get something that might be palatable to your budget committee. Well, a couple points. I think that, um, that budget proposal we think represented the, the framework of what can be a legitimate budget so that this impasse can be ended. As you know, that was not considered because the governor had, had said at that point that the sales tax was a vital component from his perspective, and if the sales tax increase was not in the budget, that he was going to veto the budget. We think by virtue of the action that the Assembly Caucus took today to give finality to the sales tax increase, to demonstrate that out of 49 members, there are only 15 who support it, that that issue can be revisited. I want to make one reference, and that is with respect to the temporary disability insurance piece that was a part of that budget. We had an extensive discussion in our caucus about that. It is clear that there are serious problems with that and many more desirable alternatives that we can explore. And we do not believe that there will be, nor should there be, support for that going forward. I would note that that was an issue that was um, 
that was ascribed to the assembly as something that we had offered when it had really originated with the New Jersey Hospital Association when they were searching constructively for an alternative to the, to the bed tax. But we do not believe that that is the way to go and that will not be part of our proposal. Is there enough time for the public to scrutinize the budget that would be introduced now and passed within a matter of days? Well, I think any, uh, any uh, uh, dis significant decisions, whether they be new sources of revenue or whether they be cuts or efficiencies, will be, um, in many cases, will be items that have been part of the public dialogue for a while. I would note that, that although there hasn't been a specific focus on each and every element of it, the Assembly Budget Committee and the Senate Budget Committee held extensive public hearings on the budget, listened to citizens about their priorities, about impacts, about revenues, about cuts, and that occurred all over the state. So I think there's already been significant input, and obviously we need to solicit additional input as we try to finalize this. When it comes to the sales tax, how big a problem was members of the Assembly concerned about their political future and their political viability if they supported this kind of tax increase? I think there clearly was some concern about it. That has been demonstrated to be a hot-button issue that has, um, that has uh, created political problems in the past. But I think that, that by and large, the, the members came down along more substantial lines. Some feeling that there are better, fairer ways to balance the budget than using what is the most regressive tax that we have, and raising concerns about the fact that at 7%, New Jersey would have the highest state sales tax, uh, state sales tax in the nation. And secondly, uh, a lot of sentiment that the number one problem facing our state is our over-reliance on property taxes. New Jersey's property taxes are 50% higher than the national average. And then whether it be the sales tax, whether it be income tax revenue, whether it be other sources of revenue, they need to be preserved so that we, as we do our work this summer to come up with property tax alternatives, we have something to work with. When are you going to have uh, your revenue bill passed through the full assembly and sent to the Senate? As soon as we leave here, the Assembly Budget Committee is going to get back to work. I don't know precisely when the committee will convene, Ballpark. but they've been working already. And we just have to be guided by, by how much progress we make. I would note that it's important for us to achieve consensus with the Senate and to develop a budget that is acceptable to Governor Corzon as well. So you're, not, so you're not then planning to pass the revenue bill without having consensus from the Senate? Well, I think that there may be some differences of opinion that get reconciled as the process goes forward. But routinely what has happened as, is in the past is that we've found common ground between the two houses, reconciled the differences up front rather than doing it at the end. And I'm hopeful that that same approach will continue. If there are 15 votes for Corazon, Understanding the circumstances, I thought it was extremely coarse. On all sides. Did the discussion center on using the sales tax? To no, I'm not going to get into tax? that. What are the discussions? What they just, what the, uh, the details of the discussion were and where they went and didn't go, other than the need to compromise and to come up with a solution. How far apart? How far apart? At this point, um, we're, we're all. Still, I'm sorry, I apologize. Still far apart, but the fact that it was, I think, cordial and we all agreed it's a bad situation we want to get out of. Maybe the light of a ladybug from a thousand yards away. I don't know. Are you any more optimistic that's about than you have been the past few days? Um, no, but I just think uh, as each day goes on, there's a feeling that hey, we got to we got to end this thing somehow, some way. What that way is. We have yet to find at this point in time. At this point, what's okay. your role? Yeah. Excuse me? At this point, what's your role in the process? I don't know, you write it up. Thank you. Thank you.
Senator came up with another six hundred million dollars in the in the Abbots. Sorry. We have uh, right. don't we have a whole gang of these. Getting a camera. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, you guys can have them all. You can Feel free to smack me. In other words, you want. Sorry. Bill Abbott was a good We're offering him. We are. The governor indicated a, a willingness to look at alternatives this morning. He said he was short about six hundred million dollars. Our budget committee has put up as much as eight hundred million dollars on the table. They're looking them over. If they feel they can work with them, fine. They may not. They may. If they do, we can probably eliminate this uh, crisis for at this point. Anyone else? Is it two different ones? Yes, sir. Two different ones. Yes, sir. I need that. I'm sorry. You have extras? Um, uh, Bill Brody, one of these, and then Bill Bill. Step up, Bill. Assembly uh, Leader Alex D. Crows. Yeah, conference Leader Peter Bianca. I'm Assemblyman Bill Barone. I'm Assemblyman Bill Barone, and I represent the town that's got the most number of public employees in New Jersey. We have brought an appropriate amount of cuts to the table to balance this budget without any taxes on the middle class or anybody else in this state. It is rationally responsible for the leaders here to lead. They are in charge. They need to bring us a budget. Bring us a budget today or tomorrow. We will stay here as long as it takes to get a budget that we can review and debate on the floor. They have a commitment to the public. They should honor that commitment so we don't have to have workers not knowing if they're working tomorrow and citizens not knowing if their facilities are open as well. Amy and then Jen Beck. My name is Amy Gamlin. I represent the 13th district. And I want to echo what my colleagues have said. We are here to work. We are here to do our jobs, just like all the other New Jerseyans who want to do their jobs and earn a fair wage and be able to enjoy our quality of life, which is going to be very seriously disrupted until this legislature is enabled to do the work that we are all here to do. And I think that it's actually very appropriate that we are all here gathered on the 4th of July, because I can't imagine a more fitting text for us, the representatives of democracy, to be doing the public's business on this day. And I'm sure the founders of our country would support us in this effort. Jen Beck. Jen Beck. That we should all be appalled that we were called here today by the governor and yet no action has been taken on a budget. The Republican caucus is here today with a proposal to cut $2.2 billion in spending and ready to take action and vote on a state budget. It is unconscionable that tomorrow we will be closing services to the citizens of New Jersey People will not have access to beaches and parks and clearly not have access to services that they are paying for. From 21 to $31 billion in just five short years, we have a borrowing that's gone up from 15 to $33 billion in just five short years. And the speech that the governor gave was very nice and very inspirational this morning, but this is the same governor that just had a five-year transportation trust fund fix that's going to cost the state of New Jersey $30 billion over the next 40 years. It's more the same, so the deeds just don't match the rhetoric. Hopefully they get their act together, and hopefully we can do something for the citizens of the state of New Jersey. Thank you. Kip Bateman. I'm Assemblyman Kip Bateman from the 16th District, and this is my 12th year in this process, and I've never seen anything like this. It's it really, it, it, it's an embarrassment to the institution. People are hurting. These are real people losing their jobs, people who made plans to be on vacation in our parks, people who tomorrow are going to be asked to pack up and leave. I think it's a, it's a disgrace. I think that we should be here around the clock. We've had this budget for over 105 days. We should pass it immediately. And I, that's, our, that's our role as legislators. <laughs> Earlier this afternoon, uh, President Cody, Speaker Roberts, and I reached an agreement on the major principles that will allow for an expeditious passage of our state's fiscal 07 budget. Once a bill incorporating these principles has passed both houses, we can begin the orderly process of reopening all facets of government and the private sector that have been uh, unfortunately forced to shutter. 
I expect that to occur within the next 24 to 36 hours. While we are understandably encouraged by this agreement, this is not a time for celebration or elation. Far too many people's lives have been disrupted economically and emotionally. Workers' wages have been lost, businesses' revenues diminished, and basic public services interrupted. This absolutely must not happen again. Our budget process and procedures are flawed, and we have an obligation to fix them. In order to restore long-term physical health to our state, we have made deep cuts in spending programs, more than $2.5 billion worth. And after this agreement, there will be additional cuts, revenue enhancements. Under today's agreement, state will split the use of the one cent sales tax increase. Half will be dedicated for property tax relief, and we will protect this money with a request for a constitutional amendment to get to dedicate these funds for that purpose. The other half will go towards balance below 08 or beyond. This too can be dedicated towards property tax relief. At a minimum, this agreement will provide for over $5 billion. Let me repeat, they've had some suggestions which we may have to draw upon tonight uh, as we uh, work through the details of the final budget. We have much more to do in the coming months and the years to fix our state's public finances and to try to meet these financial challenges. We, in fact, have only taken a halting first step. Our work this summer a couple, uh, uh, more than a week ago. So, what is your reaction? Well, I, well, what Speaker Roberts got here was a commitment to dedicate money, which wasn't there before. It was, it was close, but it's not the same. Uh, my issue is, I wanted to see more reforms, and I'm, I'm not supportive of sales tax in any way, until we do more reform in government. So, the governor's promised that. Uh, I trust him that he will do that and I'll work with them to help make that happen, but I can't support a sales tax. Some Republicans are saying that Assembly Democrats lost in this, in this, this week. I don't think anyone lost. I think, I think Speaker Roberts was successful in guaranteeing that $500 million won't disappear like the millionaire's tax did. You know, you know last a year or two ago, that we did a millionaire's tax, and they guaranteed that was going to be the reform, and it disappeared into the general budget. What Speaker Roberts was successful in doing, along with Senator Cody, was to guarantee that that money would be guaranteed to be there for property tax relief. That's a little bit different. I don't think it's a loss. Uh, no one wins in fights like this. The, the real losers were the little people, the workers at the casinos, uh, that were adversely affected. And, and that was most troubling, for, I think, for everybody. What happened was the legislature came together, seeing these faces and seeing the pain that was inflicted upon them for a sales tax, and they, they uh, decided they had to resolve it. Finally, are you concerned about the political implications of angering the unions with some of your suggestions for closing the budget gap? As a union leader, I don't see anything wrong as a friend coming to them and saying, you have to be part of the solution. You, it's much better to be part of the solution coming to the table working with us to devise solutions than to have solutions placed upon you. Thank you. We finally broke the impasse last night. Well, I think last night was historic in some respects that the uh, Democrats and Republicans, uh, some on the Budget Committee, uh, understood that the time for the political gamesmanship had to stop and there was a recognition that something dramatic had to be done to bring a halt to the, uh, the nonsense that's been dominating Trenton for the last six days. So what happened? Well, I think some uh, like-minded Democrats and Republicans got together and said, uh, we're not going to be fooling around and, and trying to pass uh, a nonsense budget. They wanted to pass a budget that was meaningful um, and, and really generate a dialogue that would push this, uh, this uh, deliberation along. We've heard that uh, in elections to come that this is something that Republicans will, will be mentioning uh, when it comes to the Assembly Democrats. What do you think the political fallout will be? Well, I don't think we have to mention anything. Just pick up the newspaper that says the uh, Assembly Democrat leadership has failed and talked about how the Democrats who have dominated both houses in the governorship have led to a complete shutdown of state government. It's not a hard story to follow. But uh, what I find is interesting is that the governor graciously acknowledged that he is looking at some of the budget cuts that we had put forward and he is going to incorporate them into this budget. So we're happy to hear that our hard work is going to have some benefit at the end of the day. So Assembly Republicans, you think this is a, a victory for them in some sense? No, I think there's a clear, clear uh, winners of the Assembly Republicans. Uh, while we're not going to be supportive of a budget, we tried to bring a basic uh, philosophy. We should look at more cuts 
uh, before we look at more spending. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. This was the number one issue, and the governor's recognition this morning that future dedications of this revenue uh, could be dedicated would go to property tax reform is really was the answer to, to the prayers of the people of the state of New Jersey and it was the, it answered the demands and the needs of the members of our caucus. And it's clearly a recognition from the governor. It's what he talked about when he ran for office, recognizing that people are just strangled by the, the excessive cost of property taxes in this state. Could you explain why it took so long to come up with, with this idea of a compromise? You know, I think people needed to understand truly that um, you know, this isn't one person's opinion. It's not the governor's, it's not the speaker's, Senate president or mine. We represent millions of people uh, individually through that caucus. And the, the clear message from the people we represent is that they just can't afford to live in this state, that property taxes are too high, that it is excessive, and that they are, they are, they are on the verge of giving up. And I think the governor's recognition that future revenue from the sales tax would go to that dedication and help relieve that burden um, is, a, is something that the people in the state of New Jersey have desperately wanted, have been waiting for for years, and I think in many respects uh, will ultimately be a large part of this governor's legacy. What do you uh, say to those who call you an obstructionist? Um, I haven't had anybody call me that yet, but uh, you know, I think, look, we are all sorry, I think every one of us, for um, the the shutdown that has taken place here, but everyone, every one of these state workers, the casino workers, they really are under the weight more than anything else of the cost of property taxes and the affordability of living in New Jersey, the ability to afford a home. And as we work through this budget and these people are restored and, and their opportunity to come to work and work in New Jersey, we want them to be able to afford to live here and retire here. And what was done here and the fight that took place um, and the ultimate compromise to the leadership of the governor, the speaker, and the Senate president is going to give them long-standing power to stay here. It's going to relieve that burden for the rest of their lives and not just on a year to your basis on a salary negotiation or a contract. When it comes to re-election, you think that, that they'll see your point? You know, look, we've had uh, five of the worst uh, budget years that you could ever imagine coming off the tragedies of September 11th and, and overestimations of uh, Governor Whitman. And the reality is that, uh, you know, we've had to do a lot of things that no elected official wants to raise taxes. But we've actually grown these majorities. Uh, we've done things in a responsible way. We've picked up uh, margins in our house year in and year out. And I think that's a sign that people understand that we are listening and that we care and that this budget result dedicating these funds to property tax reform is another sign that we're listening to them. Some people had said that in South Jersey, if you raise the sales tax, that basically guarantees you're not getting reelected. Was that on your mind during the fight? I think, if, uh, I think our concern was if uh, that money were to go to a, a budget and a government that was wasting dollars, that was not refining what it was doing itself, that money, much like the millionaire's tax years ago, would evaporate and be gone, and that it would be a, it is a reliable and steady stream of revenue that would not be there for property tax relief. Seventy-five percent of every dollar we spend in the state of New Jersey goes back to local governments and it's what drives our budget and that goes back to local governments to deal with the issue of the cost of property taxes. It's why this summer session is imperative, it's why uh, if people think these discussions were difficult, the summer process is going to be very difficult because it's going to be a change, change in status quo. The status of diaper, sir, that was when you said you're meeting tonight. Yes. Yes. You see, that's why you can't leave here. Speaking of not leaving here, I'd like to, I've already interviewed yes, yes. Assemblyman O'Toole, but I'd like to interview the two of you. Sure. Okay. Um, and uh, Senator Gormley, as we were talking about in the hall, you said there's some clear winners and losers out of this process. Well, the, um, I don't want to get into political analysis. Uh, what I do know is uh, we have to focus on the people who weren't involved, who lost the citizens of the state of New Jersey, and we've got to get them back to work. So right now, Assemblyman and I are here focusing on what's the schedule so the people in Atlantic City can go back to work. Uh, the Assemblyman and I cross party lines uh, to stand up and say the governor was doing a good job because we had to keep our people working. And sadly, um, I guess you could say Democratic leadership in the Assembly failed miserably. This proposal has been on the table for a while. As you well know, it's the same half penny they talked about, now they're dedicating it. Who couldn't have thought of that two weeks ago? Well, good, they thought of it, that's great, we all support it. That's like breathing. How about those people who lost their paychecks? How about the pandering? How about all the, the insults at the governor, who's, he might be in the opposite party, 
but he's a gentleman. And he's been open, he's been fair, and didn't deserve the way he was treated. But listen, that's over, let's move on. But we want to get people back to work, so we're st we are still here. We were here last Friday night to 11 o'clock, making sure about the weekend for the 4th of July. As you know, I don't think two legislators have been here monitoring the situation because we had such a severe financial impact, and at the same time, we were working for the governor. And we were baffled by the Democratic Party doing this to the working people of the state of New Jersey. What are you going to do to try to guarantee that these well, workers get paid? To you? Well, well, there's nothing we can do to guarantee the, the casino workers being paid. We just got to get them back to work. And hopefully, we're waiting on the scheduling. They will be able to get back to work as soon as possible. But I but don't... How about that mispay? I mean, is well, there something I, I, you can do past the... Do no, need to pass no. I, 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 I can't pass an appropriations bill. No, and there's workers all over the state affected by this private sector people all over the state were affected by this. So I don't want to represent that I can find a way to do that. That would be unfair to them. I just got to get them back to work. Was it Republicans ultimately who kind of broke the impasse? Well, I don't know about that. What I find that been extraordinarily refreshing is this governor, his door, when he says his door is open, his door is open at all times. Uh, we've been in and out of his office a number of times offering thoughtful proposals. Philosophically, sometimes we didn't agree. We're from different parties, but the 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 respect that he's shown, the openness that he's shown, has been uh, a big part of, of of breaking this impasse. And I think if it's any indication of working relationships in the future, it, it, it will be very positive, very healthy for the state of New Jersey. What's your reaction to the budget? It would seem we're about ready to get. Well, for starters. This budget is different, this budget process is different because of the governor. As I've said many times, what's been different about the culture of Trenton in the last few weeks is this governor speaks with integrity, and most of all, he's a man of principle. And he's always stood for his principles, he's stuck with his core philosophy, and in doing that, he's changed the dynamics of budgets. In the past, you waited till the last week, deals were cut, you saw what the budgets have looked like the last couple of years, and New Jersey has lost. In this particular instance, I philosophically don't agree with everything, but I can't be more complimentary when I see a man who stands on principle, sticks to it, and puts forth a budget that by and large is uh, fiscally responsible for the state of New Jersey. So you're saying that this, the way Corzine does things may have actually caused this in some sense, but it's better than the way we've done it in the past. That, that's correct. It, I, I, and I shouldn't say that, that he caused it, but certainly um, the way he's conducted himself as governor, his staff, uh, they're beyond reproach. Uh, the Treasurer Abelo is extraordinary, Stuart Rabner is extraordinary, and when the governor puts fine people like that with incredible integrity in place, I think it, it raises the level of integrity for the entire process and ultimately to the citizens of New Jersey. They can look at what's going on and after all the years of scandal we've had, I think they can look to this governor and say, there's a man of integrity here, a man of principle. So then what would be the problem of the Assembly Democrats in his own party? I don't want to speak for them. Uh, I've kind of been scratching my head for the last uh, number of weeks and uh, you, you know, you, you better to ask them. Thank you very much. Uh, to the compromise. Overall reaction is pleased that one, we've reached a compromise finally, uh, that our folks can get back to work and providing services to the public, um, and that it seems, you know, on its face to be a good compromise. It's sound. It's a break from the sort of budget culture of the past, and I think it's going to move us forward. So I'm, you know, my general reaction is I'm happy. I'm also happy to be going home after a long week. You know this process very well. Are workers going to be out again tomorrow? Um, outside here? Are they going to be out of work again, or, or could they be back to work in the morning? Um, I don't think they'll be back to work in the morning. Um, you know, the, the position that uh, the governor had taken initially was that the Constitution prevents sending people to work and paying people without an appropriation, and I believe that continues to be uh, the reality. So, but I do understand that it's going to be an expedited budget process with a number of allowances from the uh, Republican side of the aisle for emergencies so that we can get through what would normally take several days um, by tomorrow night. How much, and, how much, um, 
how much of a driving force do you believe that the casino workers coming here today played? Because we've seen the CWA out every day for the past couple of days. I, I actually think that it was cumulative. I mean, I think the fact that 45,000 people were already out and that, you know, nearly 40,000 more were out today, that we've maintained a steady presence inside the State House with our members, um, inside, outside. And, you know, I think that the casino closing in that way, which was very dramatic, you know, really did have an impact as the week progressed and the urgency was getting greater. What your emotions are right now? Well, at least the people of New Jersey know they're going to get their state back and public employees are going to go back to work and casino workers are going to go back to work. This process has been a failure. We have failed them and the least we can do is get them back to work as fast as possible. I'm actually going to propose the assembly rule change that the governor mentioned. If there is not a balanced budget agreement seven days before the constitutional deadline, the Assembly Budget Committee should have to meet in constant session until it works out an arrangement. We can't just say never let this happen again. We need to make it a rule that it can never happen again. This has been a disaster. It has hurt the people of New Jersey very, very much. Hurt my constituents directly. I've had thousands of public employees furloughed, not getting a paycheck, who wanted to come to work. This state government, the leadership, failed them. We, can make, we must make sure it never happens again. What are you talking about? That was like one giant, beautiful sound bite. Thank you. And <laughs> generally looking for your reaction to the governor's speech and the end to the impasse. Well, of course I, I support the, the governor's uh, uh, position and also not only the governor, but I think the fact that we were able to get the three leaders together and agree on uh, a resolution of this problem. I supported from the very beginning, I supported the, uh, the sales tax and I think that and the reason I did that of course is because I think it allows us to begin to uh, establish a sound foundation upon which we can have property tax reform. Re you need recurring revenues in order to meet recurring expenses and I think this is what this governor said from the very beginning. I've been here for a while and I've seen some of the ways that we've had maybe a patchwork kind of uh, trying to correct some of the deficiencies that are here. I think the governor was, uh, was right when he said that we need to move on into uh, being able to establish very, very solid kinds of foundation to move forward for property tax uh, reform. Do you, do you think politically this could hurt Assembly Democrats moving forward? Oh, of course I think it is. You know, I, I have to give a lot of respect to the, the fact there were those who were saying that we should not have closed the, uh, the casinos, etc. Well, that's a constitution. That, that you just simply do not take the constitution and pick out those things that are more fa most favorable. Even if it meant that there were those who might have seen this as uh, being very hurtful, etc. The Constitution, the law requires that if, in, if at June 30th you do not have a budget or July 1, you simply cannot expend money, and that, that was it. You can't pick and choose those things that the Constitution says you can, can or not do. And I supported that, that the governor's position, and I have supported the fact that we finally were able to come together with the, uh, the Speaker and with the, uh, with, the, with the Senate President. <laughs> Grants more than two and a half billion dollars worth. And after this agreement, there will be additional cuts. To close the budget gap, we have been regrettably forced extensions and revenue enhancements. Under today's agreement, the state will split the use of the one cent sales tax increase. Half will be dead. And one shot gimmicks have left New Jersey in financial distress. We have taken a major step towards correcting that in this budget. Although this agreement took far too long and caused undue harm, it puts us on a path towards with property tax relief, which is, I think in everyone's mind, the number one issue we have to address in this state. We look like the people across this nation. And while the events of the last week may have not been the finest, one of the finest moments in New Jersey history, I honestly think, in the end, with the agreement... Not on. So you got a bike? You know, it's one better.
Okay, you're on. Sir, are you ready for the cigars yet? Come over here, Senator. No lights, smoke, and fire. Senator, Senator what did you say, Senator? Senator? Where are we now? Please close. stop. We close the state house. No, no, no. Come on. Tell us where we are in the budget negotiation. We're, we're negotiating when we're close. Okay, don't look as optimistic as when you went in. You went a little bit more optimistic. When you went in, you said it would be done in an hour. Boy, you can't read. You can't read a face at all. <laughs> <laughs> Senator, you got it all. Well, Senator, you know, where are we? Where are we? Where are we? Where are we? Is there a deal? Are we close? Are we close? Are we close? Are we close? Minutes? We're close. Real 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 close.